Hello, welcome to week five of Contemporary Art. This week there are two lectures that I'm planning on having be short, uh, about 30 minutes each, on performance art. And there is a whole slew of YouTube videos that I want you to watch this week in lieu of having longer lectures. There are lots of snippets available out there of different performance artists actually performing. So there's some clips of Joseph Boyce, of Chris Burden, of um, Gilbert and George, and other performance artists, including um, some Fluxus people, that I would like you to see um, performance art and concept, you know, videos and things like that. That I want you to see because we are we are um, talking about a whole different media or a whole different realm of art making that isn't captured so well by by film stills. So. Please take some time to go through and watch the um, performance pieces that I've got posted this week and the conceptual films that I've got posted this week in addition to lecture. And uh, I'll, I'll try to mention as we're going through the lecture what things uh, to look for in these videos. Okay, so the medium that we're talking about this week is one that we've seen kind of in nascent form in earlier lectures, and that is the medium of performance where instead of having a object that the artist creates, it's the actual activity of the artist that becomes the work of art. If you think back to Eve Klein, for example, and his living, uh, or his, um, excuse me, pieces where he would direct models to paint, that was as much a part of the, per of the um, product that he was making as the finished piece. Uh, also, Piero Manzoni of the Arte Povera movement and his living sculptures where he would sign people, right? You're kind of moving away from the idea of a fixed, stable object that the per person creates and moving toward the idea of an experience or a, um, a, a moment in time created by the artist that you have to experience. And this even goes farther back if you think back to the uh, Gutaj movement right after World War II in Japan where you have uh, Kubota... Or, Oh, I forget, Kurzawa's wrestling with the mud or uh, Murakami breaking through many screens of paper. We've seen this idea that the artist as an, uh, a body creates a, creates a piece in time, time-limited piece, in different places before. It really becomes a part of the mainstream art world. And, I mean, this continues to this day. Performance is an important medium of contemporary art. Uh, but it really gets a foothold in the 1960s. So that's what we're going to look at today and next time. Probably the first piece that is classified now historically as performance art is this piece that was created by Alan Capro, who was a teacher at Rutgers. Uh, and Alan Capro did this this piece here called 18 Happenings in Six Parts in a Gallery in New York in 1959. He was a, uh, he, he just died last year actually I believe. He was very interested in this idea that you could erase the boundary between art and life and this should start to sound familiar right? This is something that uh, Robert Rauschenberg had said about his combine paintings. This is something that is continuing to be an interest of artists. What is the difference between art and existence? Capro, later on in his career, would actually spend a week working as an assistant to a gallery owner in New York, and he called it a performance piece, but basically he went around and did the stuff that you're supposed to do if you're a gallery assistant, you know, make photocopies, bring coffee to the owner of the gallery, stuff like that. Um, uh, so, you know, to, blurring the boundary between art and life to the point where you couldn't see it anymore. Uh, anyway, that's later on. Here, Alan Capro's 18 Happenings in Six Parts was a time-limited series of evenings in this gallery, which he had divided up by these flimsy, almost transparent screens that are covered with sheets of plastic. In each of the different parts of the gallery, the six parts of the gallery, there would be some different activity going on as you walked through the gallery. So in one room, he had a friend of his juggling oranges. Uh, in another, he had a friend just um, bowing on a violin. Um, he had this idea that that these unique experiment or experiences orchestrated by an artist were a different kind of, you know, 
um, a different kind of art product. So Capro's idea here was a very important beginning point, and this word happening actually took hold in the 1960s and became a standard part of um, artistic, the artistic avant-garde of the 1960s. A happening is a kind of performance piece that um, is a one-off, and it can be anywhere. It can be in a gallery, it can be outside of a gallery, it can be in public space, it can be wherever you want it to be. Usually these are one-time only things and they would be sort of meant to disrupt your you know, everyday agenda and call attention to the um, sort of creation of, of art. Uh, let's see, to have unexpected interactions. Happenings, performance pieces, are also influenced by the work of the composer John Cage, who you should be watching video of him last week and this week. John Cage, I've mentioned before, he is in, is in the center of this kind of creative movement that's happening in the 50s and 60s. He teaches first at Black Mountain College in North Carolina. He moves to the new school in New York City, where he gives lessons in uh, classes in experimental composition w to which many artists actually uh, attend and they and he, his ideas become important for them i think i've mentioned before john cage's uh, piece of music called four minutes and 33 seconds where uh, he actually wrote a piece of music where a pianist comes and sits down at a piano opens the score and sits there for the time of four minutes and 33 seconds. During that time, the audience basically generates the piece of music as they're listening, starting to wonder what the hell's going on here, starting to shuffle through their programs, looking for a program note about this performance, uh, coughing, maybe unwrapping cough drops, murmuring to one another. The sounds generated by the audience in this kind of irreproducible one-time only event that takes you out of your normal expectations for what you would expect to happen in a concert hall, um, that found music made by chance. That was the essence of John Cage's sort of sense of um, how to compose. And that is a very influential idea, not just in music, but also for performance artists and for artists who are trying to think of new ways to get their, uh, to, new ways to work. And here I've just, let's see, he, uh, oh, and back to Alan Capro. So this was influential on Alan Capro. He was, um, very interested in John Cage's type of experimentation and again you can see you can see examples of it if you um, when you go on the YouTube or when you go into the the links for this week there's all these YouTube videos to watch of him let's see um, here I'm just gonna read you a quote from Alan Capro and let me show you another view of 18 happenings in six parts this is a view of another room where other parts of the action are going on so Capro described these early, earlier experiments he did with this in like 1958 as action collages. So here's how he morphs into the happenings. <clears throat> the action collage, collages then became bigger, and I introduced flashing lights and a thicker hunks of matter. These parts projected further and further from the wall into the room and included more and more audible elements, sounds of ringing buzzers, bells, toys, etc., until I had accumulated nearly all the sensory elements I was to work with during the following years. I immediately saw that every visitor to the environment was a part of it. Another important idea. And so I gave him opportunities like moving something, turning switches on, just a few things. Increasingly during 1957 and 58, this suggested a more scored responsibility for the visitor. I offered him more and more to do until there developed the happening, the integration of all elements, environment, constructed sections, time, space, and people, has been my main technical problem ever since. So here he's got a total environment in which the viewer is an important piece of the composition, randomness and chance, and um, kind of blurring or erasing the boundary between the artist as creator and the viewer as consumer uh, is all going on in this kind of work. 
So that's Alan Capro and his uh, important sort of early uh, forays into performance art or happenings. Uh, the, another important group, actually, that will influence the development of this kind of artistic expression is a group known as Fluxus. And here I've just got a list of important names of people who are associated with the Fluxus movement. Most uh, primarily, George Machunas, who was a Lithuanian immigrant to the United States and was actually a wealthy property owner. He owned a lot of rental properties in New York City. And he became really interested in patronizing the arts, in sponsoring artists. And he issued a manifesto about what he wanted Fluxus or his kind of um, artistic image to, or artistic uh, vision to include, and uh, formed this group, Fluxus, that did all kinds of performance, conceptual, um, process-oriented works of art throughout the 1960s and 70s. In fact, there are still artists who are continue to consider themselves associated with Fluxus, and you can go online on the web and see lots of um, interesting stuff about Fluxus still today. For our purposes, though, we're talking about the 1960s, and so I want to talk about some of the early important artists who were associated with Fluxus. Other names you should know. Nam June Pike, Vietnamese immigrant who is a, um, or was, he, he passed away last year. Nam June Pike was a video artist, so we'll talk about him. He's associated with Fluxus. Shigeko Kubota, she was uh, married to Nam June Pike, and she's also a sort of video conceptual performance artist. Yoko Ono, you may be familiar with her as the wife of John Lennon of the Beatles. She was also a Fluxus artist. Um, Kubota and Ono were both women who had come from Japan, which again, interesting because remember what had gone on in the 50s in Japan with the creation of the Gutaj group, so there's a kind of heritage going on here that's uh, porting into Fluxus. Let's see, Joseph Boyce, he was a German man who um, um, came to the U.S. And, and actually had been in the um, German army during World War II, but was very traumatized by that and was kind of anti-war after World War II very much a, a, another associate of Fluxus. Um, Alan Capro, who we just looked at, became associated with Fluxus because he and George Machunas shared a lot of sort of similar ideas about what art is supposed to be. And um, John Cage also became associated with Fluxus because, again, their ideas were rather simpatico. I'm just going to read you one of Machunas's variations on the Fluxus Manifesto. And here, this is again, there are some themes emerging here that you're going to continue to hear in the contemporary art period. Flux's goals are social, not aesthetic. They are set up like this, step-by-step -step elimination of the fine arts, music, drama, poetry, painting, sculpture, etc., etc. This motivates the desire to direct wasted material and human capabilities towards constructive goals, such as the applied arts, industrial design, journalism, architecture, engineering, graphic, and hypographic arts, printing, etc., which are all areas that are closely related to the fine arts and offer the artist better career opportunities. Okay, one of the interesting things here is this idea of um, getting rid of the fine arts and making art that everybody can be a part of. Um, social goals, not aesthetic goals. Here is something that's a little bit of an echo of Duchamp, who said it's the concept, not the retina, that is important. Okay, so let's see. The first Fluxus Manifesto uh, or Manifestation was a publication called Fluxus that Machunas made. It grew out of musical events of people centered around John Cage. And uh, in fact, many of the people who became mainstays of Fluxus had attended John Cage's course in experimental composition at the New School in uh, 1958, including uh, Namjoon Pike and Alan Capro had both taken this this experimental um, uh, course. Let's see, in 1963, Machutas published another Fluxus Manifesto, which declared war on, I'm quoting, the world of bourgeois sickness, intellectual, professional, and commercialized culture. Machutas really saw Fluxus as being 
free of those confines and able to work in any way, not really worrying about tradition or uh, art criticism or things like that. Here are other examples of, let's see, manifestos uh, and added on to over time by George uh, Machunas, and you can see here, purge the world of Europeanism, um, purge the world of dead art, imitation, artificial art, abstract art, illusionistic art, mathematical art. Wow, that's almost everything that's come before, right? So here, they're throwing away all the media that come from the past and get into a living art, anti-art, non-art reality for all people, not only critics, dilettantes, and professionals. So, and it, you have to think too, remember, we're talking about the 1960s, an era in which this kind of rebelling against so-called bourgeois mainstream culture has become fairly widespread. You have the explosion of new forms of rock and roll, you have the whole youth culture and the hippie movement and um, this kind of anti-establishment. Uh, ranging from everything from stuff that's more sort of tame like Woodstock to stuff that was more radical and more political like the um, creation of sort of these militant student groups that were responsible for a couple of um, bombings of, of, um, of banks and things like that. So you've got a range of um, a range of kind of anti-bourgeois activity and this seems to be why, or I mean, it's a culture that at the time is ripe for this kind of anti-establishment, rebellious, uh, new sort of strain of, of art to come along. This also is a time in which not only is there a youth culture that's emerging and really rejecting the whole, you know, series or sense of tradition and history and all of that within the realm of traditional fine art media, but there's also a emerging movement among academics, especially in France. There's a whole new kind of approach to analyzing language and culture and history that is questioning the way that people have thought about the past before. Uh, and we'll talk probably a little bit more about this, but I mean, there's this kind of rejection of the whole idea of great people writing history, you know, that everything is, that history is just a series of biographies of great men. Um, it's, the, it's called the great man theory of history. In the 1960s, there is a move towards rejecting that and saying, no, really history is created by the efforts of regular people and the, you know, whether they're soldiers or farmers or what have you, uh, a real turn away from this idea of great individual heroes, which you see in, again, in academics, you see it sort of as, a, as a, a rewriting of history or rethinking of how to approach history. In art, you see it as a rejection of the idea of the artist as a hero and the idea of traditional media and moving towards this more integration of art and life that is so, so much a kind of part of fluxus. Going along with this idea of everybody being able to make art, this isn't performance per se, but this is, you know, at the heart of the Fluxus agenda. Here, this was, um, George Machun has put together a so-called Flux kit that was filled with, you know, tiny little uh, prints, stamps, um, all sorts of materials that you could play with and put together to make, um, make a, a work of art. Also, scores for, or that is, you know, uh, directions for how to stage events, um, little snippets of film, journals that you could write in. A uh, flux kit could be had. You could, you could buy them through the mail from George Machunas uh, for a relatively modest sum. If you bought just a single, a single event or a single kind of little piece of a kit, you could buy one from between one and five U.S. dollars. Flux kits were, um, a, a complete flux kit like I'm showing you here, was about a hundred bucks. There are about 25 objects in the 1965 edition of a flux kit to about 40 in 1966. So this is all kind of like art in a box, do-it-yourself, 
sent through the mail. I should mention that another thing that Fluxus really originates is the idea of postcard art and mail art, that is art that is specifically designed and then sent through the mail to other artists and becomes a kind of performance integration of everyday life into the realm of, of art. And mail art continues to be a genre that Fluxus associated artists work in. This flux kit, by the way, was influenced unsurprisingly by Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp had done the similar kind of thing in the 1930s where he created these, uh, basically, a boîte en valise, that means a box in a suitcase. But here, he's got miniature replica editions of some of his most famous works of art, including, I've got a close-up of it there, the uh, fountain from 1917, uh, and his bride uh, stripped bare by her bachelors, even the large glass, which remember this was an influence on John um, Jasper Johns um, and John Cage and, and Merce Cunningham and Walk Around Time. So uh, anyway, there you've got little miniature replicas of Marcel Duchamp's greatest hits, basically that he could send you through um, the post in in his. Um, is a, a kind of mini uh, museum basically so that is where the direct inspiration for the flux kit comes from and that's one aspect of what fluxus associated artists do another arena in which these guys will work and guys and girls is in a kind of quasi-musical performance. Here is an early performance by Nam Jun Pike, video artist who we will look at again later in the course. Nam Jun Pike, this is a 1961 piece, action with a violin on a string, and literally what he did with this is he tied a violin to a piece of string and dragged it on the floor behind him. And as you can imagine, as the violins Bumping along on the floor, it might make some random sounds and random music. This is a different way to make sound, to make music, incorporating chants and using the medium or using the object in non traditional ways. Namjoon Pike had been in Cage's experimental composition course, and so this was a direct kind of outgrowth of his exposure to John Cage's um, theories. This is a snapshot of, John, of Namjoon Pike doing another one of his famous early pieces called One for Violin Solo, and this is from 1962. In One for Violin Solo, 1962, very, very, very slowly, Pike took a violin, raised it above his head, and then at the end of his performance, he smashes the violin down on the table, and the noise and the crash and the sound that is generated during that smashing of the violin is the piece. He became very, Pike had started out as a, a, a music major, he became very interested in the whole idea of new media and the whole idea of alternative ways of making music and new technologies and what they made possible and so he started to branch off into a different direction. Here I'm showing you from the late 60s one of Pike's first real performance pieces that, that incorporates this idea of music and then new technology. This is his TV bra for living sculpture. And I've got actually on the web, there's an interview with the woman who was the cellist who did a lot of these collaborative pieces with Pike. The TV bra for living sculpture, there is Charlotte Mormon who was the cellist. As you can see, she is literally wearing a, a bra made out of two small televisions. And as she plays the cello, the TV um, was taking the transmission of the sound from the cello and distorting the images that were playing on the TV based on the vibrations of the cello. So the sound would be modulated by the technology that she's attached to. 
this was a first example of what Fluxus artists called intermedia. That is, instead of multimedia, intermedia, where you've got different technologies, different media working together to create a finished, uh, finished project, product. Here I'm just going to read you uh, a short statement from another Fluxus artist to kind of get the, the flavor here. Uh, a guy named Ken Friedman said, <clears throat> As I see it, Fluxus is a laboratory. The research of program of Fluxus is characterized by 12 ideas. Globalism, the unity of art and life, intermedia, experimentalism, chance, playfulness, uh, and there I think you can probably see that in this work, Simplicity, implicativeness, exemplativism. Don't know what those means. I think he was making up words there. Specificity, presence in time, and musicality. So here that can maybe help, hopefully give you a sense of, um, of why Pike is so kind of central in the early development of Fluxus. So here's another Namjoon Pike performance slash intermedia piece. Here, now Charlotte Mormon is, where, is making noise on a cello made entirely out of televisions. Same thing going on as was going on with the TV bra for living sculpture, where the sounds she's making on the cello are actually fed back into the system that the cello's hooked up to, and then the t or that the TVs are hooked up to, and then the TVs distort whatever image is playing on them based upon the frequency of sound that is uh, being admitted here. He also did a piece, a collaborative piece, with, uh, with Mormon called Opera Sextronique, in which Mormon discarded an item of clothing after each movement of the performance, which was very, very, by the way, this was in 65, 66, very, very um, easily accepted in Europe and then very scandalous in the United States, I guess. And here's another piece that they cooperated on in um, Germany as boring as possible from 1966. And I just brought that in to show you how, um, you know, th there's an element of playfulness and tongue-in-cheekness going on with these, um, w with these Fluxus artists. Another important Fluxus artist is this woman, Shigeko Kubota. Here I'm showing you her vagina painting from 1965. Now, Think back to the action painters from the 1950s, Ch uh, Jackson Pollock, for example. Think back to the Gutage artists painting as they're suspended over a canvas with their feet dipped in paint. Here, for the first time, we have a woman coming in, and she's not only challenging the traditional media that you have going on and the traditional ways of performing, but she's also kind of sticking her tongue out at, so to speak, right, at figuratively at these earlier kind of macho male movements in um, creating a, a abstract art. So here in this vagina painting, she actually has a, a pair of underwear on and then um, she's got a, a paintbrush attached to that pair of underwear and then she's, you know, dipping it in paint and kind of waddling around over a canvas to create her uh, work of art. So here she's playing with not only art historical tradition that's reaching far back into the past, but also with more recent um, developments in the arts. Shigeko Kubota, as I mentioned, was Namjoon Pike's, um, Namjoon Pike's wife, as well as, uh, as a performance artist in her own right, and the two of them actually collaborated on a few things. One of uh, Pike's pieces, or excuse me, Shigeko Kubota's pieces was in, it was related to and involved with this chess game that I'm showing you some still footage of here. In 1968, the, uh, in Toronto, there was a performance called Reunion, organized by John Cage, which included a chess match between John Cage and Marcel and Tini Duchamp. There, the picture on the right, you can see Marcel in the background there, uh, and Tini, his wife, to the very left of that picture on the right, and then the guy smoking the cigarette with his back to us is John Cage. This was a performance in which the um, Cage and Duchamp and his wife played a game of chess. 
And as you can see, it's not just any old chessboard. It's actually a chessboard that has been wired to generate sound and light patterns and also has been wired to record all of the actions that are made on the chessboard. So this is a performance with a kind of intermedia specialty. This is, um, this is um, intermedia performance. It's also chance, you know, depending on what happens during the piece, um, depending on what moves are made, it's all sort of generated by the participant artists here. All of this data that was recorded was taken by Shigeko Kubota and remanufactured into several intermedia pieces that reflected on the importance of this event. She did a book, she did a videotape, and a video sculpture from about 1968 to 75 dealing with the subject of this seminal event, Reunion, the chess match between Duchamp and, and Cage. I always like to bring this in too because it shows you how a guy like Marcel Duchamp, even though a lot of his ideas are stuff that came out of the 19 teens, he was still alive, he was still around and kicking, and he still was literally in the thick of things and knew these younger artists. And so it becomes more and more clear how much of an influence he must have had over this next generation or two of artists coming up. There's another view of the chessboard on the left, which you can see has been wired for light and sound. And then there, another view of Teeny and Marcel versus Cage um, during the chess match. And this is just a, I think it's just a program. Sorry, you can't see it very well, a program from the, the reunion chess match. Okay, well, here is one of the pieces that Kubota created out of this event, a book with still photographs and some um, text describing the event, uh, photographs taking the performance, and then a little 33 and a half RPM record of the reunion sound recording accompanied by a text written by John Cage. Okay, so there, there's a little collaboration going on between Kubota and Cage here, as well as between Cage and Duchamp and Kubota with the sound recording of the event accompanying the texts and uh, photographs. Here I just brought back the Cunningham Dance, Found Dance Foundation's Walk Around Time from 68 just to remind you that we have got an ongoing kind of intellectual collaboration between these younger artists and guys like Duchamp. There's Duchamp's um, large glass or bride strip bear by her bachelors even turned into performance pieces or performance set pieces for uh, the Cunningham Dance Group. The score of this was created by John Cage, by the way. And I think I've got Jasper John's um, set pieces here in the Walker Arts Center. So just to remind you of how important these guys are and how central they are as mentors to and intellectual forebears of the, the people who are coming up in the 60s. Here's another example of the products that Shigeko Kubota made from the recordings of the Reunion Chess Match. This is from, uh, well, it was completed in 1975. It's a sculptural TV put on the floor with the monitor facing up so that it looks like a chessboard and the, there's transparent glass over it with transparent glass chess pieces, which kind of extend the sculpture into three dimensions outside. You know, the light projecting up from the TV would be captured and reflected and refracted in various ways by those chess pieces. And so it's this kind of, um, and it would play, a, it would play the video recording of the chess match and the different lights that went off during the chess match um, looking at the board, right? And then the, the light projected there would be filtered in different ways through the, the glass chess pieces. Um, okay, so let's see. And the original soundtrack also plays from the uh, sculpture. And she seemed to envision this as a kind of, you know, the masters speaking from another world so that they could go on an eternity playing chess and, and, it, and younger generations could see them playing chess. Kubota said one of the things she liked 
about video is it was a medium with no past history, no objecthood, no agreed upon value. So it was kind of a blank slate for young artists to work with. There wasn't, like with oil painting, there's 600 years at least of tradition that you have to deal, to deal with, right? With video, it was all new, so it was a whole kind of new playing field. And in fact, one of the things she said too in 1991, looking back at her career, was that video because it didn't have this long history, it hadn't been established as a male-dominated field, and so male and female artists could, be, as she said, begin competition at an equal point. And this is something that we will see when we look at the developments of the 1970s that a lot of emerging like feminist artists really like about new media is that they haven't already been completely co-opted and, and cemented into history, and so it gives them a, a way in.